everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Economics by Dean Carlin and Jonathan Mordock. Today we're going to be doing chapter 14, problem number 8. The problem begins by giving us a graph that looks like this, that has marginal costs, has the monopolist demand curve, has the monopolist marginal revenue curve, and of course we have quantity on the horizontal axis. I put big Q here because it's market quantity because, hey, there's only one company in the market, that's what a monopoly is. And here, the textbook put price, but I put dollars per unit here just because that technically is more accurate when we're talking about marginal cost. Marginal cost is not in units of price, it's in units of well, dollars per unit, right? So you have something that look like, looks like this, and actually there's a grid on the version in the book so that you can tell where the, cur where the curves intersect and whatnot. And I'm not going to draw that here, but whenever we figure out where a point is, I'll look back here and tell you what it is numerically, okay? So part A of the problem says, what is the profit maximizing level of output? So we have a general rule regarding profit maximization that actually holds whether or not a firm is a monopoly. And we say that profit is maximized, profit maximized at the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And we usually don't run into weird situations where marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect in multiple places, because we usually see something that looks like this, where we have marginal revenue that's decreasing as quantity increases, and marginal cost is increasing as quantity increases, so that there's only one point of intersection. And we also see in general that the marginal revenue curve starts at the same point on the vertical axis as the demand curve, but it's twice as steep. So this is pretty accurate, and we generally see diagrams that look something like this here. So then we can just say, well, if this monopolist is maximizing profit by deciding how much it wants to produce and sell, we just have to find this quantity. Well, we can just go here, say marginal revenue, marginal cost, and our profit maximizing quantity for our monopolist, I'll call this Q star sub M for monopoly, is just the quantity at which these curves intersect, right? And if I look on here, that is going to be at a quantity of three. The next part of the problem asks, what price will the monopolist charge for the quantity that we just found? So. If we look here and we say, well, what price does the monopolist want to charge if it wants to maximize its profit? It wants to charge the highest price that it can in order to actually sell all of its output, right? So, and that's what the demand curve shows us, right? The demand curve tells us, you know, at any given price, how many units are demanded, but reading it the other direction, it also tells us what the maximum price we can charge is to still have consumers buy a particular quantity of output. So we can say here, if we want to be able to sell three units of output, we can charge a maximum of the corresponding price on the demand curve. So if the monopolist wants to ma maximize profit, it's going to set the highest price it can, which is given by the demand curve. And we can call this P star sub M, again, for monopoly. And looking at this here, that is going to be a price of $35. So you get something like this here. The next part of the problem asks, what are the efficiency costs, deadweight loss, of monopoly output slash pricing? And then it wants us to show that graphically and also give a numerical answer, which I can tell you, you know, if I can tell you what the numbers are on the little figure that we're calculating the area of, right? So we can see here, we can think about, well, in order to figure out what this deadweight loss or this inefficiency is going to look like, we have to compare the monopoly outcome to a situation that would be socially optimal. And in general, we can say that we get to the socially optimal level of output and corresponding price, of course, when we set a price equal to marginal cost. So this is, again, just generally true. And you'll notice that we're going to get some inefficiency with our monopoly because 
we can just see here really easily that our monopoly is not choosing to set a price equal to its marginal cost of production because the price it's charging is up here at $35 and its marginal cost at that quantity is something less than $35. So we can think about, well, where here would we have a situation where price is equal to marginal cost? Notice here, whenever we think about price, you can just think about the demand curve. So I just put a little reminder here. So if we're going to think about a situation where price is equal to marginal cost, that would just be, well, price given by the demand curve, marginal cost, we would be getting a quantity of output here. Call this Q star sub EFF for efficient. And this shouldn't be too surprising because one of the things we said before when we were talking about competitive markets is that competitive markets are efficient, they maximize the amount of value created for society and so on and so forth. And they actually do satisfy this condition that they are producing where price is equal to marginal costs. And notice that when we were talking about competitive markets before, we had a supply and demand diagram. And we said that the supply curve was actually the sum of a bunch of individual firm supply curves, which were in fact the firm's marginal cost curves, or at least a par portion thereof in these competitive markets. So we can think about the analog here. This would be the analog of our supply curve. This would be the analog of our demand curve. So again, it's not surprising that the socially efficient outcome would be here. And also, not surprisingly, the socially efficient price, say P star sub EFF for efficient, would be here. So we're seeing, you know, the basic conclusion of monopolies is that they end up producing a lower quantity than is socially efficient, and they end up charging a higher price than is socially efficient. So we have to think about, well, where is this inefficiency? Where is it coming from, right? And we say that a market is efficient when it's setting a price equal to the marginal cost of production because what that means is that all of the units where the consumer values the item more than it costs to produce on the margin are getting produced. And none of the ones where that isn't true are getting produced also. So when we have inefficiency happening, it's either because the market's producing too much and it's producing units that cost more than the consumer values them, or it's not producing enough that it's missing out on some units where the consumer values the item more than it costs to produce. And we can see here that the market's producing less than is efficient, so it must be that latter case that we're looking at. And in fact, what we can see here in this region between the monopoly quantity and the socially efficient quantity is that there are units where the consumer values the item this much here, the producer, it only costs them on the margin this much. So there's an efficient trade that could happen there. But that trade isn't happening because it's not specifically profit maximizing for the monopolist. And it's not specifically profit maximizing for the monopolist because the monopolist is saying, hey, yeah, I'd love to do that. But if I lower the price to you and there was no price discrimination present, I'd have to lower it to everybody. And that's not worth it. So we can think about where this deadweight loss is, and it's basically going to be a summing up of all these vertical distances where the consumer values the item more than it costs in the margin to produce, but those units are not getting bought and sold. So we can say that our deadweight loss is this amount here. And we could also go through and do this in a more roundabout fashion that we could actually calculate consumer surplus and producer surplus under perfect competition or the you know, forced analog of that, meaning this price and this quantity, and under monopoly. And we would see again that this is the area that gets left out. And we could do that by noticing that producer surplus, even with the monopoly, would be calculated as everything below the price that the monopolist gets, everything above the marginal cost curve, and everything to the left of the quantity that it's actually selling. So we would see under the monopoly, the consumer surplus would be here, be this triangle, below the demand curve, above the monopoly price, to the left of the quantity, 
transacted, and then produced our surplus would be this trapezoid here, that we would be missing this triangle that we would be getting if this monopolist was acting like a competitive market. So that's just another way of seeing that this is, in fact, the deadweight loss. I've gone on about that probably more than is necessary, but I think that this is a really important concept or set of concepts to understand. Because sometimes textbooks sort of like gloss over the fact that we're using the same terms and we're using the same concepts, but we don't literally see a supply curve, we see a marginal cost curve, and so on and so forth. And it's important to understand how to go from one to the other. Anyway, now we need to put a number on this guy, right? We say, well, it's a triangle, so that's not too hard. We could say that the deadweight loss is just the size of this triangle. So area of a triangle is just one half times base times height. In this particular instance, I want to label this here as my base. So we're doing it sort of on its side, so that the vertical distance is the base. And then this horizontal distance here is the height. Okay. So we can just say that the height of the triangle is the distance between these two quantities, and the base of the triangle is the distance between the actual monopoly price and this intersection point here. So I can label a few more things for you. Let's see. It looks like from what I see here, the socially efficient quantity is 4.5. And it looks like the efficient price is about 27.5. And it looks like the point on the vertical axis where marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect is in fact 20. So that should be all we need, right? So then we can just say the deadweight loss is one half times, well, that vertical distance is now 35 minus 20, which is 15. And the horizontal distance is 4.5 minus 3, which is just one and a half. So multiplying this all together, we just see that our deadweight loss is one half times 15, which is seven and a half. Seven and a half times one and a half is going to be $11.25. Notice we measure deadweight loss in dollars as we technically do with consumer surplus and producer surplus as well. So we can say that this monopoly acting like a monopoly or this monopolist acting like a monopolist creates $11.25 in deadweight loss compared to a situation where it was instead acting in a socially efficient manner, or in other words, like a competitive market. The next part of the problem just asks, what is consumer surplus under monopoly output slash pricing? And illustrate this, this area on the graph. So we can actually do that, and we can also calculate it numerically, right? And this is pretty easy because hey, we already kind of did this, right? That I said one way that you could find the deadweight loss is to identify consumer surplus and producer surplus in both cases, and then find what's missing in the inefficient scenario. So we said that consumer surplus was everything below the demand curve, above the price that the consumer pays in the monopoly, if we're talking about consumer surplus in the monopoly, and to the left of the quantity that's being transacted in our monopoly. So what we would see is the consumer surplus in our monopoly situation is this triangle here, just like we said. And we could come up with some numbers on that. We could say that consumer surplus is again a triangle. So you just do one half base times height. And now we can see the base of our triangle just goes from zero to three. So you just say one half times three times so this was 35. I told you that the intersection point on the vertical axis is just 50. So our height is just 15. So we get our consumer surplus that's just 1 half times 3 times 15, which probably, there's a number of ways you could do this. You can say you know, 1.5 times 15, which is going to be 
$22.50. So we can say that there's consumer surplus of $22.50 generated even in this monopoly situation. The last part of the problem asks, what is the loss of consumer surplus under monopoly outcomes versus efficient outcomes and it wants a number? Okay. So we can think of how to calculate this. If we're looking for the loss in consumer surplus, now I can put that as the change in consumer surplus, but that's cheating a little bit. Because we specifically are looking to do the case where you're getting the bigger consumer surplus minus the case where you're getting the smaller consumer surplus. And based on what we know about markets, we know that that's going to be consumer surplus under efficiency minus the consumer surplus under the monopoly, right? Because this is going to show by how much consumer surplus decreased as we were going to this monopoly. And we already did that, so we already know what this guy is here. This is just minus 2250. So we just need to understand what consumer surplus would have been if this monopolist were instead acting like the socially optimal benevolent planner, whatever we want to call that, right? In other words, if he was doing this. So again, we can say that our consumer surplus is just the area of a triangle, and we could note that if the monopolist was behaving optimally for society, not for itself, then we would be at this outcome here, so at this price, this quantity, and our consumer surplus would be everything below the demand curve, above the socially efficient price, and to the left of the socially efficient quantity, right? So we could calculate that and we could see that that's going to be, you know, one half base times height again. But now the base is the socially efficient quantity, which is 4.5. And then the height is the difference between 27.5 and 50. So that difference, I believe, is 22.5. I don't trust myself enough here, so we're pulling out the calculator. So I can say now 0.5 times 4.5 times 22.5 is equal to $50.625. And then we subtract out this 22.50 for a difference of 28.125. So consumers lose a little bit more than $28 of surplus because this guy's acting like a monopoly rather than like a bunch of firms competing with one another. One thing that's interesting to note here, just briefly, is that the reduction in consumer surplus, or the amount by which the consumer got screwed because of this monopoly, is actually larger than the amount of inefficiency that was created by the monopoly. Right? So we can think about, well, how can that be? And the reason that that is, not surprisingly, is because the producer was actually made better off by virtue of being a monopoly than being a bunch of competitive firms. So the consumer is worse off, but then the producer is going to be better off, and the sum of those two changes together is going to be this inefficiency here. So what you could actually do if you wanted to is you could use these two numbers to back out how much better off the producer is under monopoly than under you know, behaving like a bunch of competitive firms, and it would actually be the difference between these two numbers here.